what I want to do today, and it's going to be heavily based on that book, uh, which actually came out of Mongolian first. Uh, it came out when I was serving as ambassador, and we celebrated the uh, 25 years of diplomatic relations. And it's kind of interesting now, because I think it was yesterday that uh, uh, Foreign Minister Sokbader met with the American Foreign Minister in uh, Washington. Um, and I say that because when I served as ambassador, Sokbatar was the um, uh, state secretary. And when the 25th anniversary of U.S. Uh, Mongolian diplomatic uh, relations came around, he told me, he said, Jonathan, how are you going to mark the, that 25 years? And so um, very conveniently, uh, it was the suggestion that he planted, which was turned into this book, Mongolia and the United States, a diplomatic history. Um, and it kind of set the stage for that. And I acknowledged that, that it was now Foreign Minister Sokbatar that uh, set the stage and, and in some sense I could say was an inspiration for this, uh, for this book. Um, I'm gonna go through quickly uh, and just to give you a sense of what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, I hope there's time for questions. I have nothing else this evening so I'm happy to sit around and talk afterwards. Uh, but basically, uh, I'm gonna give a quick introduction as I'm doing right now. Um, I'm gonna go on to the um, early encounters uh, and then looking into diplomatic history. I'm a diplomat, so maybe it's a bit heavy on that. Um, and then go to what's called the three Ds, which is how the US and many countries interact with the world, uh, development, defense, and diplomacy. And then I'll finish with some, uh, some final uh, reflections. Uh, introduction part, uh, the, the, the convenient place to stop, start here is, it's actually uncertain when the first US visitor to Mongolia came or for that matter, when the first Mongolian visitor went to the US. Although one might well speculate that the first Mongolian visitor to what is now the US was in prehistoric times when they went along the land bridge to Alaska. So I think that the Mongolian exploration of the US goes back, back much, much further. Um, I might say even as I start that this presentation is very heavy on American encounters with Mongolia. Maybe it's, uh, it's out there in Mongolian and I don't know about it, but I think it would be a great dissertation topic for somebody to talk about Mongolian encounters with the US. In the Mongolian literature, what did they think the first time they met an American? What was the first Mongolian to set foot in modern day America? That would kind of be interesting as well. Um, this presentation will also be quite heavily anecdotal. It's gonna sound like hit the highlights and buried under all this, of course, is a whole bunch of interesting stuff. And you'll s detect uh, my passion for history including the history of the connections between uh, the United States and Mongolia. The fact of the matter is, and I would love to be proven wrong, and I may well be proven wrong, uh, but uh, when we celebrated that 25 years of diplomatic relations, uh, someone in the, in the Mongolian National Archives brought my attention to this travel pass, which is shown here. And this is actually only about a third or a fourth of it. It continues much longer. Um, as far as I know, uh, Western travelers began in larger numbers to go through Mongolia around 1859, following the old tea route uh, from Bay Peking to uh, St. Petersburg. So if that happened in 1859, maybe there's gonna be an earlier pass, maybe there's things I don't know about, but in terms of an American citizen literally setting foot in Mongolia, uh, as far as I've discovered, this is the travel pass. I understand it's written in Old Manchu, which I can't read, uh, but it definitely describes this guy who was given this travel pass as an American citizen, um, which makes me speculate. 1862, by the way, was very convenient because it meant 150 years of US-Mongolian engagement, 25 of those at a diplomatic level. But be that as it may, I am told that the translation here gives a Mr. Pelosi, or Mr. Pelosi, which is quite a famous name in American politics, um, gives Mr. Pelosi, along with a French traveling companion, so I guess the French and the Americans are getting on pretty well then, uh, it gives them permission uh, to travel together through Mongolia from Peking, from Peking to uh, Petersburg and you know, via Kiatka, which is what, uh, which is what happened. Um, so I don't have it here, but apparently there's a second travel document um, which is sent from the border post at Kiatka back to Urga, to Ulaanbaatar, that says that these two travelers approached on camels. At first they thought they were both Russians but it turned out to be that one was American and one was French. Uh, so that's an interesting vignette. I'm also told, by the way, that that travel pass says to give uh, that people, Mongolians, they meet along the way, to treat these guys nicely uh, and not to either accept or receive bribes, which is kind of interesting when you think how far that, uh, how far that goes back. 
Um, be that as it may, there is, it is sort of confirmation. And by the way, what was given to me at the time as a 25th anniversary gift, if you will, was facsimiles of these travel passes and this report from the border post, uh, which um, uh, very nicely, the next time I was back in Washington, uh, since we as diplomats and public servants can't keep gifts, uh, presented to the Library of Congress as a sort of place for the American people. And from time to time since then, when there's special events at the Library of Congress involving Mongolia, you'll notice that they put out this travel pass and acknowledge it as at least one of the early uh, meetings, if not the, uh, if not the, uh, the, the first one. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, this um, first American, if you will, Mr. <coughs> Pelosi or Pelosi, uh, became the first of, uh, of a steady stream of visitors. Um, and as you'll see in the, my discussion that follows, we'll talk about the people-to-people, uh, the, people, the human relationship side, which to me is, 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 is so important. And as I mentioned before, um, is very heavy on the US, Mongol the U.S. encounter with Mongolia, not the Mongolian encounter with the U.S., although that sometimes appears in this as well. Uh, so move on to the earlier encounters. Um, this was published only six years later, so it must have been written... Uh, uh, you know, he, he, might, he must have visited maybe uh, 66, 67, I'm not sure. Uh, but this is a guy called Thomas Knox. And uh, if you also look, there's a, a, a journal called um, Galaxy, which I think the, 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 the journal article in that Galaxy magazine became the one or two chapters on Mongolia that's included in this volume, uh, Overland Through Asia. And uh, Thomas Knox is a very interesting guy. He was from New England. He was a war correspondent in the Civil War. Um, he went for, it was for a New York newspaper, uh, the New York Herald. Uh, and he actually, if you read the history books, he managed to uh, make the two major Union generals of the Civil War, uh, General Grant and General Sherman, very angry. So I, I can speculate why he may have decided to go to Asia, but be that as it may, after the war he went to Asia, he had a phenomenal writing career. He wrote 45 books. Um, many of them were actually adventure books and kind of like in keeping, I guess, with the European tradition of exploration and adventure and, you know, Asia through, in this case, American eyes. Um, but he, 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 he took that journey through Mongolia and as far as a documented written account, again, I would love someone in this audience to prove me wrong and get an earlier one. But in terms of detail, the past just mentioned the name. This one, uh, Thomas Knox left the detailed descriptions behind, which are actually quite touching. He uh, professed admiration for Mongolia and for Genghis Khan. Uh, I'm just speculating here, but one of his, his lines is, around their fires at night, no stories are more eagerly heard than those of war, and he who can relate the most wonderful traditions of daring deeds may be, cer may be certain of admiration and applause. So you've got to speculate that when Thomas Knox, the Civil War correspondent, is going through Mongolia in the late 1860s, he's telling stories of his encounters in the, uh, in the, um, uh, in the Civil War. And in fact, one of his Civil War books is called Campfire and Cotton Field, uh, which again, that's sort of this campfire theme. Obviously, that's what, one of the things that, uh, that he enjoyed doing. Um, of course, one may also speculate, um, as academics will, that um, some of the verbiage, some of the language is sort of the license that foreign travelers have often taken when they've gone through Mongolia, projecting, as it were, their own myths and fantasies on a Mongolian stage. So you have to sort of do that as well. But he does have some good descriptions. He talks about Mongolia as opening into a series of plains and gentle swells. He compares the rolling prairies of Mongolia to uh, Kansas and Nebraska, which I guess he would be familiar with. Uh, he talks about enjoying the boiled mutton as the staple dish of, of Mongolia. And he says it's given without sauce or seasoning, but comes out all dripping and steaming, which of course is a, is a meal, I guess, that many other people have experienced since then. He also, I think the best part of his chapter, by the way, is he's coming into, Mon into Ulaanbaatar, Urga, from the, from the east. And he, he talks, it's quite interesting, because he talks first about the, um, the small Chinese uh, temp uh, settlement, where there's a Taoist temple. Uh, and then, of course, he runs into the larger houses, as he calls them, where the Russians stayed, which is now where the Russian Orthodox Church is. Has anybody seen that small little Taoist temple beyond the Russian church? It's kind of interesting. I took a visit a few years ago with uh, Michael Aldrich, who's written a book on, on Ulaanbaatar as well. Some of you may see it, may have seen it. Also published by, uh, by Hong Kong University Press, which published my own book. 
And uh, we went by there, and you sort of see some very small remains of that, first that Chinese uh, settlement as, as Knox saw it, and then on to the Russian settlement. And as you know, there's a handful of houses here still dating from the, um, Russian, uh, the Russian time. But what was intriguing to me, uh, and these are quotes that some people may dredge up and maybe they use now, is he was kind of prescient about where Mongolia was going to go. So he talks about the Chinese hold on Outer Mongolia as being, in his words, not very strong. And he talks about the Mongolians as being indifferent to their rulers and ready at any decent provocation to throw off their yoke, which of course is what they did about 40 years, uh, 40 years later. Um, he also suggested at the time uh, that uh, Russia had an eye upon Mongolia. And he said that uh, in his view that Russia was already thinking about taking Mongolia under the what he's called the powerful protection of the double-headed eagle. And of course, that was in some sense part of the expanding Russian empire at the time. So it's kind of some interesting uh, quotes. These are the more famous figures. There's uh, unknown people, of course, that passed through. Uh, Franz August Larsen, the so-called Duke of Mongolia. Um, I think people are generally familiar with him. He was here for decades. Some people might say, why are you claiming him as an American? After all, he was Swedish. And uh, I think the best biography of him is, in fact, in, Swe in Swedish. He's an interesting figure, and um, for a lot of reasons. He was an orphan, he grew up very poor, and he really found himself when he came to uh, uh, Mongolia, I guess originally as a missionary, but later more as a business person. Um, and I guess the American claim comes because his uh, wife was American, and later in life he did, in fact, take on American citizenship, and he spent his retirement. He lived a very long life. Uh, uh, 87, I guess, he spent his retirement years in, uh, in the United States. Um, it's interesting also because when he, as a young adult in China, the so-called Boxer Re Rebellion, he took a group of, um, of, of 22 people, Swedish and American missionaries mostly, across the Gobi Desert, across uh, Mongolia, and on into Russia, uh, very possibly uh, uh, sparing their lives. Um, supposedly, Larson crossed the Gobi 36 times, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. And most of the time it was by uh, camel or by horse. I have to think he must have done it by car, although my sources don't say that. But he did cross at least once by bicycle. And I think you in Mongolia are, are accustomed to seeing Western travelers you know, bicycling across Mongolia. Well, Larsen did that 100 plus years before other people as well. He bicycled across the, uh, the Gobi Desert. Um, he finally left, uh, he, he was very involved in Mongolia in all kinds of ways. I think one of the estimates is that he, when he got into business, over the many years, many decades he was in Mongolia, he claimed to have exported something like 200,000 uh, Mongolian horses uh, onto China and elsewhere, I guess. So he was a horse dealer, I guess. Um, he left on the eve of, uh, nearing 70, he left Mongolia in 1939. And um, uh, again, he, sort of an amazing character because even after all those years, uh, his retirement, he uh, first started to try to uh, operate a chicken farm in Alabama, and then he became a housing developer in California. Um, and some of the recollections we have of Larson were actually left by his granddaughter, uh, who said that she grew up hearing stories about wolves, about Chinese bandits, about fermented mare's milk, and about horse races. And the interesting thing about, uh, uh, about uh, Larson is that... Um, uh, supposedly, and I think this is maybe a reflection of his, of his love of Mongolia, is at the end of his life, the two favorite things he enjoyed was uh, uh, horse racing, uh, betting on horses. They, said, they say he won a lot of money in retirement as, as uh, watching the horses. And they also said he enjoyed watching uh, uh, wrestling on American television. It was, if, you, if any of you have seen uh, the American wrestling, it's quite different than in Mongolia. Uh, but I have to think that that love of wrestling came from that. Of course, the other iconic figure is uh, Roy Chapman Andrews, uh, perhaps the m most well-known in the U.S. at least of the, uh, of the travelers during that time, and probably the most um, uh, significant engagement before we had um, uh, diplomatic relationships between the two countries. Uh, what's not up there is a picture from National Geographic, but there he is on uh, Time magazine, uh, there he is in a, in, a, in a comic book, and of course there he is at the uh, Flaming, Flaming Cliffs. And uh, of course, you can read lots of things as you might want to when you go back into Travelers, what they represented, um, even the racism, you might say, in some of his uh, accounts. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, one of his quotes is also, I have found my country, he wrote after his first visit to Mongolia, the one I was born to know and love. Um, he also described Ur Urga Ulaanbaatar as the most fascinating city I have found in all my wanderings. 
And he did indeed wander all over Asia, Indonesia, and other places. So he'd seen a lot of the world, uh, but he really was drawn to Mongolia. Um, uh, of course, in the US, after Indiana Jones came out, people said, well, maybe that movie was patterned after this. I don't think the historic record would, would support that necessarily, but he was that kind of flamboyant uh, figure. Wrote a ton of books on the Trail of Ancient Man, Ends of the Earth, Across Mongolian Plains, The New Conquest of Central Asia, um, all about dinosaurs, the heart of Asia, and the quest for the snow leopard. Uh, and I think uh, if, to the extent that Mongolia figured on the map or the mental map of Americans during the uh, Depression, it was because they read those National Geographic articles and they saw his pictures, uh, which are kind of intriguing to this, uh, uh, you know, to this day. Um, let me just move on. Uh, let me see. So I, I, I'm trying to think if, well, maybe a couple of photographs will come up because there's a couple other things I do want to mention. Maybe they'll come up later, but other early travelers, I guess what you'd have to include would be uh, Herbert Hoover and, um, uh, and uh, you know, General Joseph Steele Will, and there's a, 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 a couple called uh, Janet Wilson and uh, her, her husband, Frederick. Uh, there's a book that came out, if anybody's seen it, Wanderings in Northern, uh, Northern China, which has some wonderful pictures of Mongolia as well uh, that she had taken. But let me, um, uh, again, I'm, let me just see here. I'm gonna, you'll see a little ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm, maybe I'm missing a couple of pictures that came in later. In any case, um, let, let, let me mention a few of these other kinds of encounters. Another one, if anybody's seen it, is, uh, this is post, post after the war, but William Douglas, the uh, member of the American Supreme Court, wrote a wonderful article on Mongolian National Geographic in 1962. And again, at a time when not many Americans went to Mongolia, uh, it was an opportunity to, um, uh, to, for people to experience Mongolia through photographs. Um, I am going to move on to uh, some other aspects of, uh, of what's happening here, the diplomatic relations, and a good bit of this book is, uh, is, is, is about that. Um, but the diplomatic relations, uh, uh, you know, basically one of the first people on this list of things that happened is Ambassador William Woodville Rockhill, who was not accredited to Mongolia. We didn't have diplomatic relations. Uh, but in fact, um, uh, was ambassador to China and also ambassador to the uh, Ottoman Empire. And on his way back from his last assignment as the Ottoman Empire, actually stopped in Mongolia for, uh, uh, you know, for, 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 for about a week. And I don't know if that was official or unofficial, uh, but the fact is, this is a guy that was very fascinated with East Asia, and I'm sure he always wanted to visit Mongolia. And the sort of sad part about this story is that um, a year after that visit through Mongolia, uh, he, he went on to Hawaii where he passed away very suddenly of a heart attack. Um, but he, he, he's an interesting guy. He was a uh, former ambassador, like I said, to China and the Ottoman Empire, um, traveled the Trans-Siberian Express, um, and, and noted some interesting comments in his own books that he's left behind. One of them, and this was um, uh, sort of at a time when Mongolia was transitioning to independence, if you will, and he definitely, he definitely noted among Mongolians a very strong desire for independence. As he, uh, as, as he put it. Uh, an interesting thing, I don't know if this is reality, but he, he, he based the, uh, he estimated the um, Mongolian population at around 700,000, uh, which is kind of interesting at the time. I guess it's, 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 it's increased uh, three times since then. Um, but uh, he, he also gave a pretty optimistic view about Urga. This is before the First World War. He talked about trade prospered, order prevailed, and people were satisfied although he was still skeptical about some of the economic future for Mongolia. Um, his books included Land of the Lamas and Diary of a Journey Through Tibet and Mongolia, both of which you can buy and look at if you want to. Um, interestingly, he donated his collection of 6,000 books. Uh, it's a, interestingly, that's about the size of the ACMS library today. He donated those to the um, Library of Congress. And if you go and you want to see the Mongolian and Tibetan collection in Washington, DC, which they'll welcome you, it's a very good collection. Much of the material is in Mongolian. The origins are uh, the library that, uh, that he left. Um, there's also a touching artifact about a guy that traveled with him in China. And again, you'll see I, I, I focus on the diplomats. This was a young guy called Thomas Haskins who, who, who passed away at the age of 29. The Library of Congress also has his little diary um, and it includes a brief description of meeting the 13th uh, Dalai Lama. It actually took place in China. Uh, but again, that's part of the, the holdings that they have. There were other, there were other uh, diplomats that visited uh, over the time. Um, the most famous, of course, was, uh, well, not a diplomat, but the vice president, uh, 
up until George Bush's visit, was the most senior American to ever visit UB. That was in 1944. Of course, the Soviet Union and the United States were allies uh, in that war. And uh, toward the end of the war, when it was obvious that the Allies would win, uh, Wallace took this extensive trip throughout um, East Asia, which included his stopover in Ulaanbaatar. Um, supposedly, 100,000 Mongolians came out to meet him, uh, and that was a pretty significant uh, uh, percentage of the population when you think about it. Um, he had a somewhat uh, uh, mystical bent himself. He was friends with Nicholas Rorick. Has anybody here visited the Rorick Museum here in uh, UB? Um, so you know about perhaps that uh, Wallace connection. Um, I think later it became, he became a bit disenchanted, uh, although it came up when he ran for president in 1948. They said, who is this guy that's hanging out with Nicholas Rorick? And there were sort of you know, criticisms there. Um, but the fact of the matter is that that connection may have been one of the reasons why Henry Wallace was intrigued with Mongolia and included it on his uh, trip. This was the very end of this 27,000 mile journey. It also took him to China, to Siberia, to Soviet Central Asia, um, uh, and like I mentioned, his plane was met by Marshal Chobelson, and he kind of had the archetypical stuff that visitors, senior visitors often get. Of course, the gear has to be part of anybody's visit. Um, he also was photographed in a Dell, which is what foreign travelers often like to do, I guess. They, he, he was in July, so it was during Nottam, so he visited some of the Nottam stuff, and his gifts when he departed included a bow and arrow, a Dell, and riding boots, and because our president Roosevelt was a great stamp collector, the Mongolians gave him a book of Mongolian stamps to take back to his president, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, I've seen the story repeated quite a lot, and I don't actually think necessarily it's based in fact, but there may be an aspect to it. Because of his interest in mystical things, uh, apparently at one of the early encounters, he went around and said he wanted to see uh, a Buddhist ceremony. And, uh, of course, you know, this was at the end of uh, Stalin was still there, but it was part of the Stalinist, uh, um, uh, you know, crackdown, if you will. And the Mongolians kind of looked around and like, what are we going to do? There's no Buddhist ceremonies going on. Um, and so according to the story, they brought some monks, some lamas out of jail uh, and set them up in Gandan Monastery and showed, and showed it. I don't know if that's true or not, uh, but I think he's credited with that. And some people even say that that interest in something like Gandan Monastery was actually quite critical in perhaps even preserving the, mo the monastery at that time. So that's an, another interesting sidelight. Um, he was accompanied by Owen Lattimore. And I think those of you who know Owen, Owen Lattimore will know why I put that don't get too close to China or Russia question mark in there. Uh, because after, in the late 40s, early 50s, of course, during the McCarthy era, uh, he had grown up in China. He knew China. Um, he also knew Russia. Um, and of course, during the McCarthy period, was accused of all kinds of things. Uh, and in the end, actually left the United States and uh, finished out his career in the UK teaching, uh, uh, teaching there. But he was, during the, during the early 40s, was an advisor in East Asia to the American administration, wrote a bunch of very interesting books, which again are, are worth looking at, uh, The Desert Road to Turkestan, High Tartary, The Mongols of Manchuria, Mongol Journeys, uh, and Nomads and Commissars, uh, Mongolia re uh, Revisited. Uh, so again, some intriguing accounts. Um, like I said, he moved to England in 1963, became the first professor of Chinese studies at uh, University of Leeds, and four years later, he became the first American, and indeed the first Westerner, as I understand it, to be elected to the Mongolian Academy of Sciences. So again, a sort of interesting connection uh, that was part of that. Um, moving on uh, to some of the other things, this of course is, uh, is backtracking a bit, uh, a bit back further. Um, but, but basically, I sort of started with those diplomatic visitors to say that um, uh, this was a long process that if you think of 1911 as the date of independence, you know, why did it take until 1987 before we had diplomatic relations? Um, of course, you had the new uh, government that emerged at the Bogod Khan. Uh, you had the letters that were sent out. It's interesting, when the Bogod Khan decided to announce Mongolia's independence to the world, he wrote to France, Germany, Belgium, Japan, Denmark, the Netherlands, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, the UK, and the US. <coughs> There's a very similar letter, and at the same time that um, uh, the, the Mongolian archives gave, uh, gave me that facsimile copy of that travel pass, they gave me the facsimile copy of this letter. Unfortunately, I don't have it here. Um, it's actually in the back of this book. You can kind of see it here. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the letter where the Bogod Khan reached out and said, please recognize us. We're an independent country now. Um, so, um, of course, all these characters are, 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 are interesting in their different ways, um, but according to the, uh, 
contemporary accounts, uh, um, Bodu, which is actually a number of years later, wrote to the American government specifically saying that he hoped that the American government would recognize the independent state of Mongolia. He also requested a treaty, a resident ambassador, commercial relations, and described this as all meant to benefit both, uh, both countries. Um, in the end, Bodu's term of office, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not very firm ground here when I talk about Mongolian history because I think a lot of people here will be more knowledgeable. But as I understand it, he only served as prime minister from April 21 until January uh, 22. Uh, and when he was asked to be relieved of his duties for health reasons, and several months after that, he was, he was executed, uh, as was the fate for a number of the early um, uh, Mongolian revolutionaries, including Solon Danzan, uh, at one point, who rep this, this is another politician at the time who represented the American Mongolian automobile company, Urga. And I think some of you, I don't have the picture here, or maybe it's gonna come up later, but he also uh, introduced the first Harley Davidson motorcycle to Mongolia, which is another interesting aspect of, the, of, of it. But this guy, Danzan, was an early advocate of the capitalist approach to development, even under, uh, so under a socialist government. Uh, and he was executed in 1924 as, again, the revolution sort of ate its children, if you will. Um, and that's why I have that uh, Prime Minister Bodu uh, don't get too close to the Americans, because some of those guys that in the early 1920s, when Mongolia was finding its way and reached out not just to the Americans, but also some of the Europeans, uh, their fate actually was to be... Uh, 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 to, be, uh, to, be, to be executed. So another interesting uh, you know, aspect of this time here is the, um, uh, the, 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 the Battle of Kalkingol. And um, uh, everybody's familiar with that. Uh, I should actually say before, be, be, before I... Um, uh, you know, before I get onto that, is that in, the, in response to some of these requests for a consulate and for something to happen, the U.S. did not open an office in, in, uh, er, in Erga, but they did open for six years in the 1920s a consulate in the town of, uh, of what's called Kalgan. Does anybody know the Chinese name for that now? Uh, I can't even pronounce it. Zhang, Zhang Jiku? Has anybody heard? Zhang Ku. Okay, um, a, a couple of my slides are missing here, but there was a picture of that, uh, and it's kind of interesting because for six years it was kind of a, a listening post to see what, what happened uh, or what was happening, and occasionally uh, they had a guy called Sabokin who was the first um, American Council General there uh, who wrote reports, occasionally went up to Urga and visited and Ulaanbaatar and talked about it. Um, and, you know, as a result of those sort of encounters, you had a series of American diplomats that talked about why, why don't we open up a consulate? Why don't we open up an embassy in, in, in Ulaanbaatar? Uh, one of them said if America had a consulate at Urga, it would be a most helpful factor in the development of a wonderful country. That was written by a, an American diplomat serving in Beijing. Uh, another commercial attaché wrote, it is the psychological moment for the inauguration of American activity in Mongolia. So there's definitely a desire on the part of different American diplomats to, uh, uh, to open up. And, this town of Urga, which I think is on the train line, at that time, that was as far as the train line reached. Um, they would go there. The American consulate was actually in a building rented from, uh, from Larson. And, um, uh, you know, the, so, so, so that they would basically go there by train and take a, uh, cars. They had American companies that were sending Fords and Dodges, there were about 25 of them, that were taking the motor route from Kalgan all the way to, uh, to Ulaanbaatar. So that was sort of an interesting... Uh, interesting sidelight as well. Um, the Battle of Kalkingol, I'm gonna have a couple slides in here that you'll sort of say, uh, you know, what are, what, what are they doing there? And of course, um, uh, the, the, the US angle to the, to the Battle of Kalkingol, uh, this was 1939. Um, there's a book, I think it's Max Hastings, someone can correct me on that too, but it was a history of World War II. And, um, uh, and uh, it, most traditional books on World War II say that World War II broke out in uh, August 1939 when, uh, when, when Hitler invaded Poland. But this particular book, which came out in the past, I don't know, three or four years, actually starts World War II with the Battle of Kalkingol. And of course, if it was a world war, uh, Japan was involved, and those were the parties that were involved there, were uh, Japan, the Soviet Union, and Mongolia. Uh, a couple of interesting pictures there of the Mongolian soldiers, the Mongolian cavalry, uh, the Soviet, the Mongolian soldier, and the helmets. Um, the helmets uh, after the battle, which of course the, uh, 
of the Soviet Mongolian forces won a famous victory. Um, I might also add the little anecdote that when I served as ambassador, one of my real honors was first to visit the site, which covers a huge area. Has anybody here been to that site? Maybe the military? It's, it's, it's really quite amazing to go around. You really need a car because it's a big area. It's a battle that lasted for several weeks. Um, so, uh, you know, that was part of it. But also, on a couple of occasions, to actually meet, when I visited some provincial towns, some of the veterans from that battle. And kind of similar to the U.S. where, uh, you know, you have veterans that are now in their 80s and 90s, kind of similar there, but it was really touching to uh, reach out and meet that. But the story there, and why there's a, I asked the question, U.S. angle, is because some people say that uh, the Japan, when they planned their attack, thought this was easy. We'll go through eastern Mongolia and come up to, to Siberia, and as a resource-poor country, this is, how we'll, um, uh, this is how we'll get our natural resources. And of course, they were defeated there. So the theory is, and I don't know what the archives say in Tokyo, but the theory is it was like, this is going to be too difficult. Let's go to Southeast Asia instead. Southeast Asia meaning French Indochina, meaning Indonesia. Um, and as the planning proceeded for that, the realization that, oh, the Americans might threaten us if we do that, so we have to knock off the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor. So some people have made the case that, in fact, there is a U.S. angle uh, because if the Japanese had won the Battle of Kalkin Gol, history might have been different. So that's one of those, um, uh, one of those great uh, what ifs. Um, the second sort of intriguing angle uh, for um, uh, the, the, the second intriguing angle for this is the SS Mongolia. Has anybody heard of the SS Mongolia? I guess you've heard of it. Anybody else here? It's, it's, it, again, you'll see my love of history, and I don't want to bore you, but it's just sort of these interesting connections over this 150-year history. And, and basically, um, there's a couple aspects about it. One is uh, very probably shot the first U.S. shot in the World War I, uh, but basically it was uh, built in 1903. It had a sister ship called the SS Manchuria. Uh, it basically crossed the Pacific back and forth. In fact, oftentimes, you see in the upper left, many of its passengers were Chinese immigrants to the United States that it was carrying, uh, carrying back and forth. It could accommodate 1,600 passengers, 350 in first-class luxury. Um, uh, later on, before the U.S. entered the war, it actually began sailing on the, um, uh, on the, on the Atlantic route across to London. Um, and then when the U.S. entered the war, uh, they put, uh, you can see one of the guns here on the ship, uh, to sort of concern over German submarines. Um, and uh, it was actually uh, shortly after war was declared that the Ameri well, American SS Mongolia with American flags, that was before the U.S. had entered the war. And so the idea is that the German submarines, when they would put up their periscopes, would see that this was an American ship and that they would leave it alone because it was neutral. Uh, when, the, um, when the war started, of course, they had to put it with guns because now they were fair game for the, uh, uh, for the German submarines. And the theory is that um, not long after war was declared, in fact, the, uh, the, the SS Mongolia took on a German submarine and possibly, uh, uh, possibly sank it. Um, uh, the, the other way it enters the war, and I say this, and the only reason I know about this is because I was at my old university last summer, 19, uh, uh, 2017. They had a display on the um, First World War, 100 years of the U.S. entry into the First World War. And there was a picture of the SS Mongolia. And there was a picture of a nurse from near Chicago area. Uh, she, along with another nurse from Ohio, had been killed when this gun accidentally exploded, sent shrapnel all over the place, and the two young nurses uh, were killed. And they were sort of memorializing their death. This was a very big deal because it was also one of the first American casualties of the war. This was before the US entered in a big way. And the, 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 the event of these two young nurses getting killed uh, on their way to, to Europe uh, really took the U.S. Uh, by storm, and or you know the news channels were filled with it. And so again, this sort of American, uh, US, the SS Mongolia kind of entered into people's consciousness about what it was about. This ship, the SS Mongolia, after the war took on a number of names, including President Fillmore, including President Johnson, including the Panamanium, which is when it was finally uh, scrapped in Shanghai in 1946. But what's interesting to me is during the the global era, if you will, of trans-Pacific and transatlantic crossings. Everybody knows about the Lusitania or the Titanic, but one of those big ships that went back and forth was the, uh, was the SS uh, M M Mongolia. Um, you know, be that as it may, of course, the, uh, you know, the war ended. Um, 
And uh, there still wasn't diplomatic relations. Uh, it still took a while. The decades went on. Uh, there were some very controversial aspects of the um, of, of opening relations. Of course, by then you had the Cold War. It wasn't until 1961 that Mongolia was finally able to open up an uh, embassy in New York. So they, it wasn't diplomatic relations, but they were a member of the United Nations, and the agreement was in the early 1960s that they opened up that, um, that embassy. Um, there were some champions of Mongolian relations. One of them was Senator Mike Mansfield. He was later our ambassador to, China, to Japan. He lived to be his late 90s. And on the floor of Congress, he championed uh, uh, US recognition, diplomatic relations with Mongolia. Uh, was not successful, but at different times he talked about it. Uh, there was also the fact that the Mongolian mission was in New York, gave them opportunities to, um, uh, to um, interact with Americans. There was a, a guy called um, uh, Walter Sheldon who had worked in Inner Mongolia and helped the Mongolians buy what's now their embassy building or their, 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 their UN mission to the UN. Um, uh, when I was in Mongolia in the early 19, uh, or early 2000s, I met a number of Mongolians whose parents had, had visited New York and had, been, had seen that mission. It was interesting to talk to them because those were some of the first, um, the first meetings with, uh, uh, w w w with Americans. Um, it was actually in 1963 that uh, the UK became the, uh, the first um, uh, Western country to recognize Mongolia. France uh, followed later. Um, but you had all these false starts. See, what you have to realize in the US and the Cold War climate, uh, when there was thought of uh, recognition, US at that time recognized Taiwan, not, Beijing, not, not Peking. And so, you know, the old Taiwanese maps, the nationalist government maps from that period had Mongolia included in China. So whenever the US or somebody like Mike Mansfield would say, let's recognize Mongolia, let's have diplomatic relations, what would come across is, oh no, the Chiang Kai-shek's government wouldn't like that. And so it kind of kept on getting scuppered. I think, by the way, by the 1970s, the, the late 70s, the US was on the verge of perhaps under Jimmy Carter recognizing it. And at that time, it was more the Soviets that said, wait a minute, we don't quite want, want recognition. So when you look at the history, you had these moments when there was almost recognition, but it didn't happen. I say almost recognition because, uh, you know, think about it. Back in the early 1960s, there were two Foreign Service officers, uh, Curtis Kamen, uh, who later became US ambassador to Chile, Bolivia, and Colombia, and Stapleton Roy, who later became US ambassador to Singapore, China, and Indonesia, that were sent to study Mongolian at the University of Washington. So somebody in the State Department must have thought, we're going to have relations with Mongolia. And uh, you know, that never happened. Although actually, Kamen uses Mongolian at least once, because he traveled to UB for a UN conference on women and was able to use his, uh, his Mongolian. Um, there were some other connections. Uh, Seddenpal, by the way, sent a, a letter to Gus Hall. Anybody know who Gus Hall was? Head of the American Communist Party. Invited him to come to Mongolia to celebrate. I don't know for sure if he actually visited, uh, but they had those kind of connections. And they did have some Americans passing through, journalists, some big game hunters paid to come out and do hunting in Mongolia. Um, so, but the 60s passed and no recognition. So, 19, and, and these guys went on to their stellar careers. In the 1970s, you had a couple other people, William Brown, later US ambassador to uh, Thailand and Israel, along with a guy called Alan Nathanson. They studied um, Mongolian, this time actually at Leeds with, uh, with uh, Owen Latimer. And again, you have to think that the US State Department thought we're about to have diplomatic relations. And you think about these guys who were selected to study Mongolian, most of them went on to stellar careers, ambassadors in major countries and everything, uh, and yet it didn't happen. And by the 1980s, still mid 80s, still no recognition. 100 countries, 99 countries had recognized Mongolia's independence, and the US had yet to take that uh, step, even though they had other kinds of uh, relations that were going on. But then it finally did happen um, on the, um, uh, on, on, on the um, well, actually, the conversation that made it happen was Stapleton Roy, who had studied Mongolian, became, like I said, ambassador to China. But he had discussions with Ambassador uh, Nayamdu, the Mongolian ambassador, and they basically worked out that agreement that, um, uh, that they would have uh, diplomatic relations. And this is the signing under, you see Thomas Jefferson up there in the seventh floor of the State Department uh, with Nayam Du, and I think that's uh, George Schultz, if I'm not mistaken, signing the agreement to open up uh, diplomatic relations. Um, what we'll move on to now is, uh, is, 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 is once those relations were established, um, you know, they, they opened the embassies in the different countries, uh, in both uh, Ulaanbaatar and in Washington. Maybe you've been to the different sites. U.S. Embassy here is on Denver Street. 
a Mongolian embassy in Washington is on, um, on M Street in Georgetown. Um, they uh, you know, began to have some kinds of relationships that were taking place. And what's interesting, I don't know if anybody from the American embassy is here, but when I was serving, they had an old scrapbook, which you could look through it and see some of these sort of barbecues and meetings taking place. One, Mongol one American diplomat at the uh, US embassy uh, had his dog appear on a Mongolian stamp. I guess it was a rare variety of dog, and they were the Postal Service was looking around for, uh, uh, for you know, dogs of the world kind of series of stamps. And you know, imagine as a Foreign Service officer to have your pet dog appear in the stamp of the country you're serving. I mean, that's kind of uh, intriguing to me. Um, another sort of incident from that time, and to sort of say, show how unfamiliar uh, the Mongolia was with the United States, US, USSR, same, same, but different, maybe, I don't know. But apparently, in one of those early accounts, the American embassy gets a call from the Soviet embassy, um, uh, and it says, by the way, we have a cable for you. Uh, it was delivered to us by the Mongolian post office. It says, US, we're USSR. Do you want to come and pick up your cable? So, so that was sort of one of those early uh, anecdotes from the, uh, from the time as well. But what I'll talk about for the remainder of, uh, of, 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 of the time here is simply the, the so-called three Ds. I'll go through them very quickly. But these are the three ways we've interacted. So most of this talk has been about pre-diplomatic relations. Afterwards, of course, you do have uh, diplomatic relations. I, I, I will say that um, I put ConBank up there because that's one of the projects that people may not know about. Uh, but for 30 months, uh, USAID did the management contract for uh, ConBank um, and actually was the first step along its way toward extraordinary success. This bank, by the way, had gone bankrupt twice, both times around political campaigns. And you know how it works in, in, in many places in the world is that's when uh, you know, elections are taking place, credit is given out, and then, of course, there are bad loans, and then what happens later? So it's a long story, but the fact of the matter is that ConBank was... Um, uh, managed by USAID for 30 months and kind of launched into a, its, its, its trajectory in a, in a better place. Uh, Cosbank is another story. Uh, that was, those were microfinance projects. One was a UNDP one, one was a USAID one, and they joined together to form Cosbank. So those are two sort of examples. There was also business development programs. Uh, I know Mitzahans here was involved in them. The, the GARE initiative focused on the GARE districts and the Gobi initiative focused on rural Mongolia. Um, I could talk a lot about the different ones, but basically, uh, you know, there was that continued engagement. MCC, um, and just for comparisons, by the way, the total um, expenditure, if you will, of the U.S. for the MCC program uh, is rough, for the first MCC program is roughly the same as USAID in all its history. So this gives them, in all its history in Mongolia. So this gives you a sense about how MCC actually is a big deal. And the, the programs there, uh, the Chor Sunshine Road, uh, the technical education project, the health project, uh, the land titling project, those are all things that were part of that partnership uh, with Mongolia. Uh, and of course, very possibly, there's gonna be a second uh, MCC. Um, what I say in my notes, though, of course, is that um, uh, you're in a better place when you move from a development relationship to a commercial one. And what I've put up there are some of these old um, uh, iconic US brands. On the left, Dodge Saved Our Lives, that's Roy Chapman Andrews, I guess, on uh, an advertisement. Uh, and then, of course, you have that Harley Davidson that I talked about. And I think that's that senior Mongolian uh, at the time who was proud of his, uh, his Harley Davidson motorcycle. Um, but again, um, just you know, thinking about the commercial relationship, that's been up and down. And my own personal assessment is one of the more disappointing aspects is the uh, commercial relationship has not been sustained. It's gone up and down. I think that uh, five years ago when I was ambassador, it was in the hundreds of millions in terms of the trade relationship. And maybe that's misleading because it includes the fact that Mongolia bought Boeing aircraft and Caterpillar was doing a lot of work with, the, um, uh, you know, with, with mining equipment. Um, I understand, actually, um, uh, that now it's re been reduced back to the tens of millions, which, frankly, is kind of disappointing because I think that for any sustained uh, relationship, you really do need a, um, uh, you really do need, uh, you know, an economic vibrant uh, factor to it. At the same time, these are the old iconic brands, Harley Davidson and uh, Dodge. And more recently, I think you have had American brands like Caterpillar, like Boeing, uh, like Jeep even, uh, uh, you know, Hummers and all that, uh, you know, make, make, make their, um, uh, you know, make their, um, their entry. Um, people will, will hear me say the statistic all the time, uh, but the fact of the matter is, when I first arrived in Mongolia in 2001, the national economy was $1 billion dollars. 
Typically, a national budget is about 30 to 40 percent of GDP. So you do the math. The Mongolian national budget in 2001 was three or four hundred million dollars. Uh, believe me, to run a country, to run a army, to run, to build roads, to do health and education systems, um, it's, it's unbelievable when you think about that. Uh, when I came back several years later, when I left in 2012, that was about 10 years after that, 11 years after that, the economy had grown to $10 billion. And then you're talking about a national budget of three or four billion, uh, which puts you in a different place. Uh, it means that, by the way, that um, you know, foreign aid back in the day, 2001, was also $300 million, which is 30% of GDP. 10 years later, it's still $300 million, but now it's 3% of GDP. And believe me, as a country, you're in a much better place when foreign aid is only 3% of your GDP, not 30% of your GDP. So we can talk about you know, other kinds of things uh, you know, related to that if you want, but the fact of the matter is that um, uh, you know, the, the business relationship is the natural thing that follows. Um, going very quickly, uh, Mongolian soldiers as UN peacekeepers, uh, that's also been part of the, um, uh, part of the engagement. Um, and you know, I, as, when you think about it, for Mongolia, um, its security often does lie in its international engagements. The fact that 100 plus countries recognize uh, Mongolia. I see a number of, of military here. I wonder if people have served overseas. Uh, but you know, as I do, uh, that the, the UN has gotten a lot of, or the Mongolian soldiers by their UN missions, whether in Kosovo, whether in um, uh, Sierra Leone, whether in South Sudan, uh, th those UN missions, I think, have, have won a lot of respect for Mongolia. And that's part of, well, you can see the, uh, the blue helmets, as it were. Um, of course, there's another aspect to that, and that is serving internationally with, um, uh, with ISAF in Afghanistan and before that in Iraq. Um, I think there's someone from Poland here uh, that was before. And you know, just to say in passing, uh, you know, there's a little connection between the um, uh, Mongolian military and, 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 and Poland, because in Iraq, the Mongolians were on the protective detail in um, Camp Charlie, I guess it was called, and there was a suicide bomber in a truck that was making for that camp. And the Mongolians protecting that camp, they had, you have a split second to decide, do our rule of engagements allow this to happen or not? And they made the decision to take out the suicide bomber. And of course, that won a lot of uh, praise for, uh, for, 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 for Mongolia as well. Um, these pictures are actually taken from the trip I took as ambassador uh, to Kabul, uh, specifically to meet with the <laughs> Mongolian soldiers who were assisting on uh, training the Afghans on how to fly those helicopters. Uh, and there they are on the left in their, in their barracks with their, um, uh, with their, uh, their ISAF medals. They were just finishing their assignment. So I think that that Mon Mongolian engagement has been kind of interesting. And um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of aspects to that, the Five Hills Training Center, other things. And I really stress that this involvement here is not purely American. You go to Conquest and you have, what, 30 countries there, India, Pakistan, um, uh, I think Philippines might have been there, Thailand's been there. Um, so multiple countries. Um, and, and, and also, by the way, China and Russia has all, have also helped out when it comes to training the Mongolian military to take on these international duties. So um, I think it's understandable that Mongolian's foreign policy is built on you know, friendship with as many countries as possible. And that actually is, 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 is reflected in, in, in some of the service uh, that they've done in, 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 uh, under the Blue Helmets or whatever. Um, I'll just go very quickly through the um, last parts, and I'm sorry to take it a bit long here, but just to go, you know, the diplomacy aspect, it's been surprisingly high level. Uh, that last visit uh, from Wallace was, was before we had diplomatic relations, but in subsequent years, this is 2005, uh, Bush comes to Mongolia. Uh, former Ambassador Sluis has written a very interesting article that I think is going to appear. She gave a presentation uh, uh, a few weeks ago recalling that visit, which was quite amazing. Uh, then you had Vice President Biden. Uh, that was during my time. Uh, he was very aware, by the way, that I, I said, you know, welcome to Mongolia, Mr. Vice President. I said, you're the, the first Vice President to visit since, uh, since uh, Henry Wallace. And his comment was to, to me was, yeah, and he lost the next election. <laughs> so he was sort of, uh, that was kind of interesting. But he was there, and of course, that's, um, he was given a horse, named the horse Celtic. Uh, then you have the series of Secretary of State visits, Baker, who's often credited with inventing the phrase third neighbor, uh, which isn't just the US, it's, it's other countries outside the first two neighbors. Uh, but uh, he's, he's come on his personal capacity. Uh, you have, of course, um, uh, Madeleine Albright. Uh, uh, you have Condoleezza Rice on the lower right. Uh, and again, during my visit was when uh, Hillary Clinton came and uh, 
That, by the way, you know, they have the ceremonial gear that some of you have seen at the government palace. And that, by the way, is uh, President Albrecht Dorch um, bringing her into the gear and basically saying, Madam Secretary, welcome to our Oval Office. <laughs> so, you know, I guess that didn't quite happen, but almost did. Um, I'll just finish up with uh, sort of concluding comments. And um, actually, in the interest of time, I'm not going to repeat everything that, that was said there. Um, but, I, I, in, in, but in terms of the book, which this is drawing on, the final chapter is only five or six uh, pages, but it, it does reflect my perspective, my reflections on Mongolia. It actually, some people may say uh, it's too optimistic, um, but I do imagine um, uh, you know, Mongolia continuing on this trajectory. My comment is always that every time Mongolia climbs a mountain, and this is hard, the transitions Mongolia has made, there's always five more to climb. But at the same time, you have to recognize your progress. And this sort of concluding comments uh, you know, tries to, to recognize that. Uh, you know, again, a lot in only 25, now 30 years, a lot's happening. Uh, but it also tries to recognize the people-to-people -people, uh, relationships that have taken place uh, and kind of ends with this. Um, uh, this is the Mongolian version of the book, by the way, U.S.-Mongolian uh, diplomatic relations. And the final line is there is quoting from that American diplomat that basically says that uh, U.S. and Mongolia, this is in 1920, that U.S.-Mongolian relationship could be um, uh, a most helpful factor in the development of a wonderful country. And when I served as ambassador, that was always the phrase I like to use, that some American diplomat almost 100 years earlier had perceived that, and hopefully that was the case. But I've also, to, again, to conclude the comment, is simply, for me, the ultimate um, connection are the people-to-people -people relations. And uh, in, 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 in the book, I go into some of the the numbers, I think there's probably about 1,500 American citizens living in Mongolia doing different kinds of things. In the US, there's about 20,000 uh, 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 Mongolian citizens. Some of them have become Mongolians over time. Um, but I think if you, they're small communities in many ways, but I think they have a, a, an important and useful impact on their respective countries. Um, and again, Mongolian popular imagination, I don't know if people heard about the horse boy, but this was, a, uh, you know, this was an autistic boy that was brought out and the horse was sort of part of the process of making him uh, better, if you will. This one I just came across with. Has anybody read the Great Mongolian, uh, the, the Great Mongolian Bowling League? Has anybody heard of that? I mean, these are examples, and I could have 20 things up there, of Mongolia entering um, popular culture. This is a novel about two old retired Americans and two young Mongolian immigrants to the United States that form an unlikely connection. And uh, you know, there's, there's some of these books are, are, are fiction, like this one, Ed Brod Borowski. Some of them are nonfiction, like 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 Horse Boy. Um, but I just sort of conclude this thing with this um, sort of interest in how popular cultures connect with each other. And again, my talk has been mostly about Americans meeting Mongolia. Um, at some point, and maybe it's out there, and I don't know about it. The reverse: Mongolians meeting America. What does it mean? What are the reflections? I uh, look forward to you know, reading that as well, because I think that's a an important part of the story. Um, I'll leave it at that, because I've, uh, I've, I've, I've talked quite a bit, um, but certainly open to any questions that people might have.